Heavenly Father. Lord, we have reached that point in the service where it's time for your word to go forth. And Father, we realize that hell is against your word. So Father, we pray that you will at this time take us out of self and put us into your spirit. Open up our spiritual ears and let us hear what the spirit is saying to the church this morning. Father, don't let your word be hindered by any satanic or demonic forces, but let it go out and accomplish those things which you intend. It's in Jesus' mighty name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. last and did my Savior bled and did my Sovereign die would he devote that sacred head for such a worm as I well might the sun go down and shut its glories in when Christ, the mighty maker, died for man, the creature's sin. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light and the burdens of my heart rolled away it was there by faith. All right. I received my sight. And now I'm happy all the day. <laughs> Hallelujah. John chapter 6. The gospel according to St. John. The 6th chapter. <clears throat> The sixth chapter of the Gospel according to John is where we get a lot of our meat. Mm -hmm. But often we don't know where we get a lot of our meat. We just know sayings that people say. Mm -hmm. We know things that we've heard a little bit of. And we just kind of trust what they say. Mm -hmm. But we'll deal with a little bit of it today mm -hmm. in this sixth chapter of the gospel according to St. John. I'm reading from the original King James Version of God's Holy Writing beginning at the 22nd verse. The day following when the people which stood on the other side of the sea saw that there was none other boat there save that one wherein his disciples were entered and that Jesus went not with his disciples into the boat, but that his disciples were gone away alone. Howbeit, there came other boats from Tiberias, nigh unto the place where they did eat bread, after that Jesus, after the Lord, had given thanks. When the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there, Neither his disciples, they also took shipping and came to Capernaum, seeking for Jesus. And when they had found him on the other side of the sea, they said unto him, Rabbi, when camest thou hither? Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, ye seek me, not because ye saw the miracles, but because ye did eat of the loaves and were filled. Labor not for the meat which perish, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give you unto you. For him has God the Father sealed. Then said they unto him, What shall we do that we might work the works of God? And Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, 
that ye believe on him whom he has sent. You may be seated. Just a little more work to do. Just a little more work. It was Jesus himself that looked out over the crowd of people one day in Matthew, the ninth chapter. Seeing the people he had compassion upon them. And he looked at his disciples and he began to speak to them in the 37th verse of the ninth chapter of the gospel according to St. Matthew. And he said, the harvest is plenteous, but the laborers are few. He said, pray ye that the Lord of the harvest in Luke, that he will send laborers into the vineyard because it is a problem because there are few people that are willing to labor. And we are a people that feel like if I work for it, then I should be paid for it. We go to work on our job, and, and it's right. That's the reason that we go to these jobs. It is so that we'll have funds to pay bills so that we can live in a certain way, at least almost comfortable, if not like some of us living from paycheck to paycheck. But that is the reason that we labor so hard, the reason that we work so hard. Jesus realized that the laborers were few. But in this text that we have today, that was something that had happened prior to the lesson text that we read. Jesus had been teaching there around the people and they heard the teaching. The teaching was awesome enough for the people to just sit under his teaching and want to hear what this itinerant teacher was teaching them and want to eat every word that he was saying. But after a while, Jesus realized that something was happening. And he looked out over the people and he said, who's going to feed these folks? The Bible lets us know that just the men that were in the crowd was 5,000. That's not counting the women and children. So it's a lot of folks. And Philip was standing there and Jesus talked to him. And, well, what are we going to feed him? He said, well, all we, we've seen out here, Lord, but I don't care how much 200 pennies won't feed all these folks. You need a massive fish fry to feed this many people. He said, but all we've seen is one little fellow with five barley loaves of bread and two fish. And Jesus confiscated those items. And he prayed over the bread and he handed to his disciples to put in baskets. And he did likewise over the fish and they fed everybody there. We know that everybody consumed enough grocery to be full and filled because Jesus said, now you pick up the leftover fish and bread. And the Bible said that they filled up 12 baskets so everybody was filled. You could have had an extra piece of fish. It must have had ground mullet. Yeah, I like fish with bones in it. Tastes a little better than the catfish. You just got to work with the bones. If you're from the country, that don't bother you. But they had this fish and bread, and they were filled. But now 
It had gotten late in the evening and Jesus saw what was happening. They looked at Jesus at that time and said, look here, we'll never have to work again. We'll never have to do anything else again. All we have to do is hang out around this man and he'll feed us. Jesus saw what was happening, that they were about to try to make him a king. Beware when folks want to lift you up. All right, man. It, 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 it's, it, it's common for, for, for pastors and preachers to want to just always be lifted up. And, and, and people will start wanting to call you a king and all these type of things. And before you know it, you're trying to act like you're a ruler of something. Right. If, if you let them. But this, Jesus realized what was happening and he left the coast and he went out alone and prayed. While he was gone, his disciples got in the boat and decided that they were going to go to the other side and, and they did. It's kind of confusing when you get down to the, to the lesson because you don't understand exactly what was happening and, and some commentators try to put it together for you but some taters are more common than others. And so you have to try to read the scripture and just let God have his way. All right, man. But how be ever, the next day about brunch, it, it, everybody not, not familiar with that term. Brunch, I, my, my daughter had to teach me. That's between breakfast and lunch. So they call it breakfast, lunch, brunch. So about brunch, everybody was looking for another fish plate. They were wanting something else to eat, it seems. And Jesus kind of alluded to that fact. So they wanted to find him and they looked around down by the water where his disciples had been hanging out. But his disciples had left and went to the other side. And you know that as the watch went through the night, Jesus walked across the water to the other side. And he was with his disciples and all of a sudden hear this crowd of folks come up. The people had followed him. Now I know where he's at. You know, if, you, if, if people know where you're at, they're going to tell them. Hey, I know where he's at. He's on the other side. Let's go, y'all. Yeah. Now, I don't think they had enough ships in the harbor to take everybody to the other side. So more than likely, some walked around. But they were just wanting to get to where Jesus was. But Jesus knew why they wanted to get to where he was. So he said that verily, verily in the 26th verse, I say unto you, ye seek me not because ye saw the miracles, but because ye did eat the loaves and were filled. It's time to eat again. And they weren't talking about spiritual food either. So Jesus saw this as a teachable moment. He said, labor not for meat, which perishes. See, a lot of people labor over things that are going to be nothing after a while. They forget about the work that really has to be done. And they go out laboring after the work that is going to be wiped out. The, in, in Peter, it says, even this world that we're living in, one day will be destroyed with fervent heat. Right. Now, we, we talked about that the, little, the other night at Bible study. See, it's, it's one thing to, to understand how this whole world can be destroyed. But we talked about a few little German men that got together one day. And they decided that they were going to do something that had never been done before. And they grabbed a hole to the atom and split the atom. And what happened when they did it was catastrophic. Mm. Hiroshima was totally destroyed. Nagasaki. Places where the atom bomb had been, it, it destroyed those places. And then man began to think. When they were searching and looking at that atom, we took measures to split the atom and 
all of these cataclysmic things happen. But what's holding the thing together right now? So when Peter was talking that this world will be destroyed with fervent heat, he was talking about something when God let go of the atom. It's not atomic glue. Mm -hmm. It's the Lord holding things. All things are held together by him. He is the one that is in control. And here these people, they, they, were, they were in this teachable moment. He said, labor not for me, they perish. They're, all of these things that you're laboring over, they're going to be destroyed one day. That old car that you worked yourself to death for, you just had to have one of them. Yeah. One thing that th one day that thing going to be rusty and sitting in the junkyard. Right, and if you're still alive to see it, you'll be saying, boy, I, I sweated and labored to get that thing. Right, that old house. Those bugs go flying around the house and chipping off here and chipping off there. The brick's still standing, but the wood is gone because them termites that ate it up. See, that, see, all of these things, Jesus had talked about it, that these things on earth, they're going to rust. They're going to perish. They're going to be gone after a while. Yeah. Jesus said, you're laboring over something that's going to be empty. It's really just vanity. After a while, when you sum it all up, but for that meat which endured unto everlasting life. Which the Son of Man shall give unto you. We won't go into that area because it'll take us too long. <laughs> for him has God the Father sealed. Mm. So the people looking at Jesus at this time said, boy, he figured us out. He know we followed him because we had that good fish sandwich yesterday. Mm -hmm. And we want another meal today. But, but, but look here, Lord. You just talked about labor. He said, they said unto him, what shall we do that we might work the works of God? Working the works of God. Here's a question for you. Can you get to heaven without good works? <laughs> Can you? No. I'll answer it for you. There's no way that you will get to heaven without good works. You're saying, boy, I'm confused now. Let me continue to confuse you. <laughs> Can you enter heaven without good character? Just doing the right thing all the time, being morally excellent and impeccable in your service toward mankind and others. Can you get to heaven without good character? May I answer again? No. We we almost finished now, Chris. All right, Ms. Moses. Chris ain't here today. Since since we since we went there, let's 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 go here also. How good does your character really have to be? How how good of character can you have to have? Good enough character to get into heaven. Can your character, have you obtained that yet? Have you reached that point yet to where your character would render you good enough to get into God's heaven? Now, but let, let, me, let me throw this, 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 this piece of wood on the fire. Your character would have to be without flaw. Your character would have to be, that's the word, Chris, say that again. Perfect. Now you won't get to heaven without it. Now you're really confused. Because everybody told you, you ain't got to be good. 
Nobody is good as Jesus. Thank you. Thank you. To be perfect. Have you ever seen a perfect person? Well, my wife some around here somewhere. I want you to see one if you need to see one. <laughs> but everybody else. <laughs> Yeah, okay. <laughs> you haven't, and I haven't seen that person. So now some of us are really confused. Because everything that I've been teaching since I've been here at New Bethel have told you that works will never get you in. To heaven. Now have I been teaching error? No. I wouldn't dare teach you anything that I didn't know for a fact that it was lining up with the scripture. Now I will admit that I may have on occasion interpreted something wrong. And may have said it, and I, I usually, when I, when I know that I've said something wrong, I usually try to go back and correct it when I know better. I, I tell y'all all the time that people that, at, at, at my home church, where we ran those folks from the church when they came in there talking about Jesus plus nothing. And, and, and I went, so after I understood the word of God for myself, Start reading and start seeing for myself. After I start knowing that when I, I used to be at a church where they spoke in tongues. I did. But when I start studying the word of God, when I hit those pages in the scripture, there where the Bible told me that if there's not an interpreter, don't do it. Say, wait a minute now. Everybody in that church is rather like lacking. <laughs> and they're telling you now that if you're not rather like lacking, you ain't even saved. Well, so back to the scripture. Back to where we're at. When you don't know, you'll pretty much take anything somebody say. That's why Bible study is so important. That's why Deacon Dejanet get up here and everybody think he sounds like a fool trying to tell us to come to Bible study. When you know better, you have an opportunity, even if you don't, to do better. You know what is right now because we sit right here and we go through it. You know, at a lot of churches, the pastor won't do the Bible study. That takes too much of his time. He will not come to the point to where he would sit down in front of his people and do the Bible study. But I wouldn't have it any other way. Mm. I, I believe that the Lord speaks to my heart. I ask him to. And sometimes when I'm speaking, I'll be like, what? man, that had to come from God. <laughs> I know it for a fact. So if, if you're the spiritual leader, then you ought to be leading. But here these people were, were very confused because what Jesus was telling them, what, they asked the question that so many asked. They wanted to know what it was, what was the work that they needed to do right. to work the works of God. Right. And Jesus just blew their minds. Jesus said, this is the work of God. Here, here, here's how hard it is. This is the work of God. That ye believe on him whom he has sent. Wow. That's too much. See, we feel like if we put in labor, then it's something that we've earned. We, we pretty much want someone to give us a 10-step a program into getting saved. And, and, and if you listen long enough on the TV tube, it's not a tube anymore, it's flat screen. If, if you listen, it's a chip now. If you listen long enough, somebody will give you a 10-step program of how to obtain salvation. 
They'll go all the way around what it really takes to be saved. Really takes to do the work of God. They'll go here and there. And they'll even tell you if somebody gave you the exact words of God out of the scripture, they'll tell you there's more. All right. But I'm telling you right now, if they go into that area, you walk away from Amen. it. Amen. It's no more. This is the word of God. Amen. This is Jesus talking right here. He said, believe on the one whom the Father has sent. That's how simple it is. That's how easy it is to do the work that God is expected of you. So we, we ask the question. Let's, let's answer the question. Who can you get to heaven without good works? We said there's no way that you can get to heaven without good works. Well, the thing about that, the, here's the trick, is not your work. Because if you worked, how much work would be good enough? How much work would render you good enough person? You have just reached work perfection. And now you can come on into heaven. How much work? Where, where do you get to the point where you say, I have reached my goal right. in work? Well. When you are trying to have this impeccable character, at what point do you say, I've reached that point? I, I, I give my body to be burned. And I do all of these other things for everybody. But my mind is still corrupt. When I look at a pile of money, I want to put it in my pocket. When, when, at what point do you realize what Paul was talking about in Galatians chapter 2 and 3? Well, at what point do we know that is not our work? Paul said, no, knowing this, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Christ. And not by the works of the law, but by you are justified because of what Jesus Christ did. Galatians 2 and 16. There's no way that you and I can be justified or our work would be adequate to stand before God one day and say, I did it. I got it all done. I, I, I've reached that point in work and character and I want to get into heaven. The problem with that is you didn't reach what God wanted you to reach. You'll never be able to do enough work. You'll never be able to reach the point where your work is good enough because Paul said it in, in Ephesians 2. He said, for by grace ye are saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. All right. If you had to work for it, then it couldn't be a gift because a gift is something that is freely given to you. Yeah, yeah. I tell everybody during the Christmas season, that's one of the best times to do teaching on grace. Because we sit, we, we, we build, we put up these trees. Hey, there's nothing wrong with the tree. It's all right if you want a tree. I, I mean, I ain't against you. We, we get this tree together and we put all of this stuff up under the tree. And somebody else sends us something to put under the tree for us to open on Christmas Day. Now, on Christmas Day, you got all of this stuff sitting under the tree. And you go get all of these boxes out from under there but one. Until you get that one, you had accepted it. That is a free gift. You shouldn't have to say free in front of gift. But we have to say it because our minds think that we always have to work for something. You didn't have to work for that which is under the tree. 
They gave it to you out of their own volition. Because they loved you or they cared about you or they felt obligated to do it. They, they gave that to you until you go and get it. Then you hadn't accepted it. That's what grace is. It's there available. Jesus has already done the work that needed to be done. He has already accomplished all the things that have to be done for you. I can't keep this thing on my ear today. Must be too much sweat. But Jesus, he's already done it. Now, after we have been saved, that's when our works make a difference. That's when our works come into play. Because we are saved unto good works, Paul said in the 10th verse of that Ephesians, the second chapter. We will work now. It is not works that get us to salvation, but we have faith. And that faith, it actually works. It wants to work. Mm -hmm. It does something good. Yeah. Now, the work that needs to be done to get us to the point of salvation, that happened way out on a hill. Yes, Somebody called it Calvary yeah. Mountain. The, the place of the skull. Yeah. Golgotha is what some say it, that it is. On that hill, the Bible tells me that they laid my Savior down over some boards and they nailed his hands and nailed his feet. Then they lifted him up in the air so that all the world could see is what the songwriter said. While he hung there on the cross, he was finishing all the work that had to be done to complete my salvation process. All the things that has to be done so that you can be saved, Jesus accomplished that there at Calvary's cross. All you have to do is what Jesus told these people here. Believe on him whom the Father has sent. Yeah. Now Jesus died there on the cross at that time. Yeah. He went to the cross to die. He came to give him himself his life for ransom for many. He said that himself. He died for you and me. Yeah. If he hadn't died, then where would we be, the old songwriter said. Where would we be right now? We'd be lost and headed to hell yeah. if we were still alive right now. But Jesus died there on the cross. We know that he was dead because Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus took his body and put it in Joseph of Arimathea's new tomb. Yeah. The tomb was hewn out for Joseph of Arimathea. The problem was Joseph knew because he was a disciple now of Jesus Christ that Jesus won't need that tomb long. Because he had already said that I have the power to lay my life down, but I also have the power to take it back up again. Amen. So after Jesus had laid there in the grave for the proper amount of time, the Bible said that he got up from the grave yeah. and proclaimed that all power, heaven and earth, is in my hand. Yeah. And because he has completed the process, he has done all the work that you and I have to do. All we need to do now is believe it. Yeah. We just need to believe what he has done. Somebody wants to bind you up. They want to have you entangled in bondage. Paul said, don't be entangled in that bondage again. People want you to be down up under the law, but the law never could save. The law was always perfect. It is still perfect. The problem is that I'm not perfect. So I need a perfect person to stand in for me. And that was Jesus Christ. You need the same perfect person to stand in for you to complete all the good work that you need to do, to complete the good character that you need to have. We have to put that on the person, Jesus Christ. We put it on him. Just a little more work to do. My Lord. Jesus said, just believe, just believe. on him. Jesus. Whom the Father has yes. yes, My Lord. That's how simple it is. I know people want you to take one step forward, two steps back, and break dance and flip over pews and yeah, 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 and run up and down the aisle. If you want to run, you run. If you want to flip across some pews, you flip. But don't you think that's what it takes to get saved? All right. All right. Jesus said it's as simple as this. Just believe on him. Right. 
when Paul met up with the Philippian jailer after he had got free from the chains and, and could have left the place. The Bible said that that jailer asked him, what must I do to be saved? Paul said, just believe on the name Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and your family because they want to be with you. Oh, that's too simple. It is simple. See, what we want to do, we think that we can clean a person up. There are some people that are saved that have a jacked up life. They're living in carnality right now. They doing anything they think they're big and bad enough to do, but that don't mean they're not saved. All right. All right. Then we look at some people and say, well, they're living on the other side and they got these other things going on in their life and ain't no way that they can be saved. Salvation is through Jesus Christ. And are you living perfect enough to get there? We just proved it that. That none of us got to that point of perfection. So we just have to keep praying for one another. Amen. That's enough there. That I agree.